Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Crime Centric. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are crime dramas. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the season two premiere of Reacher. Great season premiere. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. Well, first and foremost, we open with what is kind of like the catalyst event for this season, and that is a guy getting murdered, like getting pushed out of a helicopter. His name is Calvin Franz, and it turns out he is part of the special investigation unit that Reacher led. And it's like, when they start bringing that up, I was like, right, that makes so much sense. That is a plot thread, especially because Finley was like, oh, have you not kept in contact with him? And he was like, no. So, of course, that makes so much sense that that was brought up in last season. It makes a lot of sense that that would be covered. I mean, obviously, this is pulling from a different book, so, I'm assuming all of season one was that book. It's called, the first season was based on a book called Killing Floor. So, I'm assuming that's just all of it. So, these are probably like one-to-one -one edit. Not like, probably some things change maybe. I mean, depending on how old the books are, probably updated. But for the most part, they're just telling the the general story of these uh, books. So, this one's like a new book that this story is pulling from. But, yeah. Uh, Reacher's still doing his wondering thing. We find out when he talks to Neely later, it's been... What was it specifically? I, it's been over two and a half years. I think it was like two years, seven months, and 19 days is what he said. It's been since he left Margraves. What's well, since everything went down? Because he was only in Margraves for like one and a half week, which I always talk about it. I love time frames. So to know that that entire story took place over the course of an, a week and a half, maybe, it's just kind of interesting. But nevertheless, um, he ends up, where was he in Arkansas at the time, I believe? And he ended up like helping this lady who was being carjacked took care of the guy uh she's like who are you he was like call the police i don't want to get involved so got my money got a receipt that was kind of an info from um neely who was telling him about franz's death and we kind of get a flashback to when the team is put together and there's some familiar faces amongst that team i talked about this in season one's finale i said like oh i saw someone's review for one of the episodes of season two and i recognize an actor but then i correct myself i was an actress and that person I was referencing was Sorinda Swan, who, like, obviously most recently know her from the show Coroner. But funny enough, and this is where we start getting to the connected thread of stuff that's kind of wild. The first thing I ever saw, my my introduction to Sorinda Swan was the show Breakout Kings. I want to say it was on A&E. It's like the show was like 2011 or 12. So this is something from like two, this is something from like 11 or 12 years ago. Sadly, the show only had two seasons. I really liked it. But this is where Connective Thread gets really interesting because that show was also my introduction to Malcolm Goodwin. That was the first thing I ever saw him in. I might have even brought that up during season one that that was the first thing I ever seen him in. But yeah, they were both in that together. Who was also in that show, funny enough, is an, 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 another Amazon alumni, uh, show-wise, would be uh, Alonzo, Alon uh, Laz Alonzo, who plays M.M. in The Boys. So, And also... I'm, I'm going to butcher Dominic's name, so I'm just going to call him Dominic. He he pops up a little bit in this episode. He's like one of the people watching uh, Reacher and Neely. He's one of the two guys. Like one guy we see later on in the episode, but the other guy we don't. That's Dominic. He was all that show was also my introduction to Dominic as well. I'm like, dude, all we need to do is get like Laz Alonzo in this in some shape or form or get like if Jimmy Simpson pops up I'm gonna lose my shit dude because it's just it's so crazy that like what that's also like I was looking through this there are so many connected threads in this episode I mean that's actors in general like some people work with other people and you're just like there's so many connected threads you can make so it's just it's just interesting last season Malcolm Goodwin was a bit part of it and Surrender Swan will be a big part of this we don't know if Dixon's still alive or whether all her stuff is going to be past stuff we'll see I'm assuming she's going to be alive present day, but we'll, we'll get to that when we get to it. Another of those people was O'Donnell. That actor who plays him, I think his name is, was it Sean Sipos, maybe? I'm probably butchering it. He was in the show Krypton, um, which if you're unaware, that was a, a essentially a Superman prequel show. And I don't want to call it a prequel because it had prequel elements to it, but it wasn't really a prequel. It's a whole thing. So he, that's another DC connection, funny enough. Uh, one of them was Shaw. He's the actor who played Jordan in the 100. Um, God, there was like one more. Oh, uh, Robert Patrick pops up in this, which I love that whole bit because apparently, because obviously we know the names that Reacher uses. I wonder, does Neely use like um, science fiction characters or something like that? Like, Pop, popular icons and sci-fi or whatever because like the name she used as her alias was sarah connor because robert patrick's character tells the dude like oh like so and because 
obviously Reacher uses like baseball players, specifically people from the Yankees. I don't remember if that was. I think it's him and Joe both did that. But either way, and it's like, and the guy was like, "Yo, Sarah and Sarah Connors and Robert Patrick is like, I don't know who that is. Or I don't give a shit. It's like that's hilarious. Obviously, they probably like a lot of the season was already wrote before they ended up casting anyone, most likely, but. I don't know if they wrote that part specifically with Robert Patrick Mon, but my mind is taking like right. They most likely cast him, and then they just wrote that little tidbit of dialogue, which I think is hilarious. Uh, if you don't know, he played what was it, the T one thousand in um, oh god, Terminator uh, Judge, well, Terminator Two Judgment Day. Uh, he seems to be an antagonist, but who was also in that was uh, you know Linda Hamilton as Sarah Connor. I think, isn't the only thing she's in, never played Sarah Connor in is the TV show and, oh God, what's its face? Uh, the Genesis movie, because I believe that Amelia Clark played. I could be mistaken. I've never seen Genesis, but I believe Amelia Clark was playing like a younger uh, Sarah Connor in that. But either way, so that was interesting. It's just like a little fun bit, which I'm like, I love inside jokes like that. Which, also, he has a DC connection because he plays Peacemaker's dad in the show, Peacemaker. Um, and also, finally, I'm going to shut my mouth back because there's so many connected threads. But the guy, AM, which we'll talk about later on, I was like, why do I recognize that? Because I saw his name and then, and then there was like, he was in Sandman. I was like, who is he in Sandman? If you've seen Sandman in episode six, the back half of the episode about the guy that lives forever that Dream eventually becomes friends with, that's, that's AM. And I was like, oh, which if you don't know... I think Sandman was a, I think it's a Vertigo series first. I mean, it's all under the DC umbrella, but I think it was specifically under the Vertigo brand specifically uh, initially. I think it, uh, I don't think it was under DC or maybe it was under DC eventually initially and didn't win under Vertigo. Whatever the case may be, it's all under the DC umbrella. So it's just, once again, fun and connective threads. I'm sorry, I get a little, like, crazy about stuff because I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. This person, this person's connecting. Now. I just, I had to get that all out. Like I said, there's actually way more when you look at some of the actors who might not have, like, familiar names or might be playing smaller bits. There's so much more, but those are the main ones that immediately caught my attention, which I thought was so interesting. But, yeah. Once again, that X-ray feature on... Um, on like the fire stick uh, on like prime video and stuff it's probably the worst thing i could have ever discovered because it just it i'm i get borderline manic about like why do i recognize this person and i need to have that answer so having the answer so readily available sometimes is a little a bit of an issue i am so sorry i went on on this whole massive diatribe it's okay that you tuned out 36 seconds into this i understand um but getting back to the point before I went on my massive, massive unnecessary diatribe is that the, t the team was put together. It's like a hodgepodge misfit team, people from different backgrounds and groups, because for Reacher, it's like, I need special investigators, not just regular military police. So to make this unit work, I pull people who are like very highly trained people. He was even talking about Laurie. It's like, yeah, he's... Um, like I'm the first, like I'm the non only non marine to like get a certain rank or win it like six times in like when it comes to firearms. But he was like, Lowry is still like the best shot. He's like, my rule is, uh, any situation like if you have to fire the first shot, it eventually will end up in a firefight. So make your first shot your best shot. But his unlikely team doesn't really gel well together. So it's like okay. So, and I appreciate how Reacher handles it later on. He basically took him to a bar, which he knew that the people there, whether they're like the 91st or whatever, that they would start shit with his 110 unit just because Neely isn't supposed to be there because of her rank and stuff like that. But it popped off, Reacher and the whole squad gets into a fight and it brought them together. It's like, yeah, uh, you know, and I mean, that's kind of that brothers in arm mentality of like, we're, yo, we, we, we beat up some people, we shed some blood, we, we, uh, we, uh, we call some bleeding in the process. And it just, they kind of almost had this kumbaya type of gathering moment. I even love Neely being like, I think we're going to be, I think we're going to be good best pals aren't we Reacher and he's like we already are Neely and I was like yes you are I, I love that because it's like and even Franz is the one that kind of figured out it's like you planned this and he's like yeah I knew the 91st drank there I know they're sticklers for um the rules and I also know they're assholes and so but it's like I needed to show this squad 
how good that they think like, oh, we have nothing in common. Because even Dixon was like, yeah, I'm going to go file some paperwork. Basically, she was going to walk away from this unit. But it's like, yeah, I've showed them that you might be from these different backgrounds and circumstances, but you can work together as a team. In fact, you're an amazing team together. And it was actually, it wasn't even Reacher. It was one of the other members who came up with the motto of you don't uh, mess with special investigators, uh, special investigators. Because that's also the tragedy behind it. Because I think that's what it's the most gut wrenching thing for Reacher is when he hears Neely talk about like for one like finding out about Franz how he died, but also finding out like oh he was married, had a kid. She actually apparently she went to the wedding because he was the one that was the hardest to get in contact with. It seems like the rest of the group showed up except for him, and he was just the wanderer that he was. And it's just you would think. I mean, because there, there's so many sad things of you were hoping that maybe after his adventures in Margrave's last season, especially after Finley was like, right, like kind of open up more to people, kind of give them an opportunity to reach out to you. And he, two years later, he still never reached out to the special investigators. Once again, I guess it's the same thing with his brother where it's just like, hey, I uh, just, I let time pass and the same thing happening. You would think, especially after what happened with Joe, that he would reach out. I guess because he was in contact with Neely and he's like, right, she's fine. So I guess he's assuming the rest of the squad's fine. I don't, he didn't know for sure that Neely kept in contact with them. He was just assuming like, oh, they're fine. But it's like, you just, you kind of just let a lot of that go. As he told Finley last season, hey, uh, we were close when we were in the army. I'm not in the army anymore. Which is such a shame, but it's like, Right, there's so much he missed while he was gone. Turns out Lori had died like two years ago. To be fair, timeline-wise, it seems like that was before he even got to Margrave's. But it's still a thing of, damn, he died and I didn't even know it. I missed a wedding and a funeral. And it's just like, yeah, so much life passed by while you were going. Like I said, you just you know he regrets it because he wished he had done things differently. Just like the Joe thing of like, you just let too much time pass for whatever reason, you know? If, even if you had the mentality of, you you should know, like, because of how short life it can be, having just lost your brother last season, you would have thought you would have reached out, but you never did. <clears throat> he was even telling Neely, like, oh, you could have sent me a message, like, you know, you sent me that code through the um, ATM, and she's like, dude, I only just came up with that idea, but you have no phone, no address, it's hard to keep up with you, so... They're trying to keep up, find out from the rest of the unit about what they know, but can't get in contact with anybody. Some of the members are harder to track down than others. Like they could catch up, they can contact O'Donnell and they're able to contact Dixon, but can't actually get in direct contact with him. Which even, uh, speaking of Dixon, which I thought was kind of interesting, uh, Neely kind of points out that apparently there was always kind of something between her and Reacher. It's like, did anything ever happen? But he was like, no. It's like, that would have been inappropriate. She's like, you were both the same rank. He's like, yeah, but I was still leader of the team. It would have been inappropriate, which, hey, I, I, I think I understand his perspective on it. But it's also like, yeah, after the military, you never bothered, you know, you know, trying to see where things could go from there. Just Reacher's not the most, not very good at just connecting with people. Like, it's easier to keep a distance because I think it just makes it easier when he just has to move on because he just... I think, you know, once again, a byproduct of, you know, moving around so much, being part of a military family as a kid, being a part of the military yourself, like a lot of that dictated a lot of core aspects of you of just like home is just, there is no such thing as home that you just have to kind of always be on the move. And he's just always been on the move his entire, every aspect of his life, even not in the military anymore. He never sticks around for too long. They ended up visiting uh, Franz's uh, widow, Angela. And talking to her and just like the gut wrenching stuff of like, you know, she's saying, you know, talks about Franz, you know, even she's like, yeah, because she even called him Franzi as well, like the rest of the, like the um, special investigators did. And it's like, yeah, he never brought work home, especially after we had Mikey, he wanted to be 100% present here. So whatever work he did, he tried to also like around the time we had Mikey, their son, it's like he stopped doing any dangerous work, or at least I thought he did. He kind of did a lot of PI work for like CEOs some like big bucks type of people. But obviously she never really knew what he really, really worked on. And the the motto of the special investigators are like, you don't mess with them, uh, special investigators. His son knows it too. And Neely ends up telling that story, which was kind of 
the 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 events that led Reacher to decide to bring Franzi onto the, the onto the group was because the way he de-escalated the situation when two uh, soldiers were fighting over a cookie. Because it turns out one of these soldiers, his mom sent him these homemade cookies, and this other soldier ate the last one. I love the funny reveal where it's actually. I guess only Reacher knew this. Maybe no one else in the squad knew this about this story. But it turns out Franzi's the one who actually ate the cookie because he thought it was for everyone. So he de-escalated the situation that he kind of caused. They were still idiots for fighting over it. Understandable the sentimental reason why that soldier got pissed. But also, like, Franzi just be like, yeah, I just... Which almost feels like that might poetically be what this season's about, like Franz trying to solve something that either he felt responsible for as a member of the special investigators because they had some connection to whatever it is that got him killed or or what. I feel like that's the major threat, but I feel like that's going to be an overarching element to why Franzi got involved in this situation in the first place. I feel like that would be poetic just to tie it in with that story in that same regards of I kind of started this or I played a role in starting this. So I have to be the one to kind of resolve it in whatever capacity and whatever shape or form that might represent or present itself. But as I, I brought up earlier with the whole Robert Patrick of it all, I don't know who he is or what role he's playing, but one of the people following Neely and Reacher, like I said, there were two people, but we only focused on one is the only one we saw repeatedly throughout the episode, and he's the one that was reporting to Robert Patrick's character. So it's we we still don't know what that threat is. It's been shown up, but obviously we'll have to wait to kind of see where things kind of go on that front with that 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 storyline thread find out a little bit more about neely and her position as a pi obviously like things are really really good at the firm or group that she's working with in fact they want to make her the director of a they're going to like open a unit somewhere else and they want her to be director of it but for her it's like she prefers being out there in the field maybe it kind of brings her back to her days in a special investigation unit and it's just kind of like i don't want to just be allocated to being like behind a desk or barking out the orders. I want to kind of get into the the mix. And what I thought was interesting too is when they were going to Franzi's office and obviously saw it was torn apart to the point they were ripping up chair legs just to make sure he was... Because when they were hiding, I figured like if you're looking through chair legs, it must be something small. Like a, it has to be a flash drive with some info on it. And it turns out that... It was in a mailbox across the street, which I love that Neely had to be the distractor to be like, oh, yeah, I'm super into stamps. I want to see all these stamps. You And I love the guy being like, oh, yeah, like these cartoon ones, they're, they're anime. I believe they're, uh, that means they're a Japanese. And Neely's like, oh, yeah, sure. And I'm like, oh, I don't know why. Some old guy referencing anime and being like, oh, I think, I think that means it's Japanese. I'm like, I don't know why. There's something wholesome and sweet about that for some reason. But yeah, I love that Reacher's trying to open all these mailboxes and this old lady's like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I just forgot which one is mine. Hey, this guy is opening all these other mailboxes, trying to open up. A, and he's like, what are you, the mail police? I'm like, I love this nosy old lady. And the guy's like, hey, can I see some ID? He's like, yeah, don't worry about it, pal. Finally gets it open. He's like, oh, got what I needed. Oh, and just, yeah, just got the wrong box and immediately takes off. I love that whole situation. But yeah, it turns out they have a flash drive and... It's not till later on that they meet back up at Neely's, uh, well, uh, the place that she's renting, and find it tossed. And lo and behold, who's there? They're finally gotten. Con- well, O'Donnell finally got in contact with him, which I love the whole thing of like, yeah, he was oh, this oversexed person, and now it's like, oh, here you are being domesticated, wife, kids, doing a whole, oh, you're going offline, no TVs, no mo- phones, no nothing once a year with his wife and kids and it's just like yeah i can't believe you out of anyone became you know that that the that, that family man type of person could it make it seem like he was like an oversex i think literally oversex degenerate was the word reacher used but yeah how this all ties into this guy named am he is someone that uses different aliases and all these different aliases i don't know if it's all his aliases or maybe the different because it's interesting because Maybe he just repeatedly... Use, well, he can't repeatedly keep using the same aliases. Because just like he ends up getting a new alias in this episode. And one of those aliases is one of the names on... Um, was on... 
uh, Franzi's like flash drive list and I was like interesting so I was like how'd you get the names ahead of time like I guess maybe he has these um IDs set up well in advance and then he comes into those areas to pick them up or something but like obviously he makes sure to burn them because he was first introduced as Adrian Mount but then like in the bathroom at the airport or wherever he burns it I guess like once he uses it once for whatever purposes of getting into um a country or a state or whatever it's like then I burn it because I don't need it anymore Maybe because he had already used that identity with something else. And so it's like leaving as little paper trail as possible. But that is interesting when Reacher brings it up of like, right, it helps to have your initial first initials be the same because all you have to do is lock down. Like, okay, for him, it's like all I have to do is perfectly always recreate the A and the M. As long as I've got that locked down, it's easy. The rest is just scribble behind those letters. So I was like, that was so interesting. I've never really heard that brought up when it comes to like faking an identity using the same initials because that doesn't really come up. I mean, even even um, Reacher doesn't do that, nor does Neely, and I don't think Joe did it that we're aware of. So it is interesting to know that. I, I love that that is just like this continuing thread about like the aliases people use and why they use the respective aliases they do. That was actually really dope too when they were breaking down like, all right, we got to, like got two minutes to, and we've got three attempts to put a password in. So the three of them, Neely, Reacher, and O'Donnell are bouncing off all of these. It's like, all right, like we're going to have to profile Franzi like we would anyone else. And so they're breaking down like all these aspects of him. I was like, what did he rep? He were at Pittsburgh because that's where he was from. He was a man of loyalty. So they're thinking this and that. And then ultimately O'Donnell's like, wait, 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 wait. Uh, if anyone ever outside of this room ever ask about this, I will completely deny it. But who did Franzi like look up to and respect above any musician or anyone else? It was, and he types in Reacher, and Reacher's like, oh, come on. He was like, and even Neely's like, dude, like a few weeks into the being a part of the unit, he started talking like you and cut his hair like you. He wanted to be you, and it turns out that was the password, which I love. O'Donnell's like, hey, don't get a big head about it, but that's not what Reacher was. Like, it was, and I think maybe O'Donnell said that just to make Reacher, like, to kind of make it a little more le levity to the situation, because... That was regret. It, it wasn't even like a big headedness of ego. That was 100% shame because it's like this guy looked up to me and it's just like there's so many people in the squad. Like I left you guys high and dry. Like it is that thing of maybe if I just done things differently, like, I don't, whatever my reasons may be, I didn't reach out and I'm going to regret that for the rest of my life because now it's, it's too late. Once again, you would have thought after he wouldn't have been able to do it with Lowry, but at least Franz, he would have been able to. Uh, but I mean, once again, at least... I mean, to be fair, uh, Neely, like, had checked in from time to time, and even she wasn't aware of, like, something could potentially go wrong until, sadly, it was over. Because um, apparently at the time, he had reached out to her about something, but she was caught up in her own work, and then ultimately, by the time she got back to it, like, it was already too late, you know? And so, she kind of has regrets about this, even though, you know, Richard tried to tell her, hey, it's not your fault. She's like, I know. Doesn't doesn't quite get rid of that guilt, but they're trying to just keep up a strong front and move forward. But like you can tell, just in that moment, you can see it in Reacher's face of like it's shame and regret of like if I just reached out, maybe I could have helped, maybe I could have been the changing tide. Especially because hey, I'm not caught up in work and stuff like that. I'm just like moving around like the nomad that I am. There was also like this list of numbers that O'Donnell was looking at because it's like right, we got all those AM names as we've got introduced to AM this episode, but. Which, once he got his um, rec uh, his uh, new ID, he ended up killing the guys that got the new IDs for him. So, probably does that to everyone that gets a new identity for him. Because the last thing he wants is anyone knowing his real identity. And, of course, they need to know his real identity. Or, there are people who know not only potentially his real identity, but also the name of the identities that he's using as he's kind of changing passports and stuff. And all IDs and stuff, so... Kind of got to get rid of those loose ends immediately. Make them loose ends, get rid of them uh, before they even become loose ends in the first place. But they ultimately end up deciding like, right, well, O'Donnell has an idea of where, he knows that Swan lives in Queens. So they end up getting the address from, I think, his wife's, like, because they have like their Christmas list or whatever, or their Christmas, like, thing that they send out. So trying to get Swan's address from her. It's like, wow, you really have been domesticated that you have this whole, like, Christmas, like, send out that you send to people and stuff. 
But they go to Swan's place. They sadly find his dog dead of dehydration. And it's like Swan would never let that happen. So if he's not here, that must mean he's already dead. He couldn't come back. I mean, granted, you were so sure about Paul last season, but this seems like this might be a little different. But if Swan's dead, that means that's two people. And they also know that Franz was tortured. So... It's interesting, too, because he was like, oh, he was hit by an iron bar that kind of broke his legs, which is so interesting considering, like, Rachel was beat up by a crowbar because, like, in retrospect, like, Dawson beat him up with one, so it makes you wonder if that's how he kind of knows specifically the, the type of wounds that a crowbar could necessarily... Well, um, he said, like, um, he specifically said, like, a uh, metal bar or iron bar or something like that could do, and that's why he was beaten up by a crowbar last uh, season, specifically in episode 7. But yeah, like someone's definitely coming after their unit and for Reacher's like good because if they're coming after us, that means it's going, we don't have to go to them. They'll come to us and it makes it that much easier because even, even O'Donnell said it himself, it's like, who, who are we going to have to go kill? Because when he found out about Franzi, he's like, yeah, I love that kid. It's just, it's such a shame. It seems like he was a young buck of the group. He seems like he might've been like the baby of this, this makeshift family because uh, Lowry seems like to be the, the grumpy dad because even O'Donnell was like, hey, okay, be careful over there with your osteoporosis or whatever when he was setting up the camera for that photo that everyone has a picture of which is so interesting because it probably means that i wonder does that mean reacher's the only one who doesn't have that photo because franzi had one in its office ed swan had one at his home so as we know reacher doesn't keep anything on him like i said he went to margrave uh yeah margraves with things and i think like i said at the time i think he left with less but yeah, so it's interesting to see that this is going to be the heart of this season, the uh, major overarching thread. It's going to be interesting to see, obviously find out who's still alive, who isn't, who's dead, how much of that stuff is just going to be past stuff. We get some of these characters in flashbacks and stuff and maybe get a peek into some of their investigations because it has to be stuff, it has to be specifically stuff that they looked into as a unit coming back to haunt them now. Now, what could it be? They've probably made a long list of enemies over the years doing what they did so uh obviously we'll ultimately have to wait to see where all this ends up taking us going forward into the next episode obviously there were three episodes released so i'm going to get to these next two episodes hopefully soon i don't i don't know what the time frame is going to be but i'm going to try and get to those uh at some point maybe i'll get to those sooner rather than later but either way i'm excited to see where all this ultimately ends up taking us but really that's all i want to talk about so the next time we meet be happy be safe live life to the fullest and enjoy it Good day and goodbye.